Hi everyone. Well, today we are incredibly honoured to have as our guest uh, the president of our university, President Jane Close Connolly. Um, and I'm sure we're all as eager as I am to hear what she has to say about being president and leadership during this tumultuous time. So, uh, Jane, let's let's get right into it and say, generally speaking, how have you been during this uh, incredibly tough time? These are really tough times, aren't they? But, uh, you know, I think our team is functioning well. Um, personally, of course, I'm privileged. I live in a big house with strong internet connections and uh, I'm doing work that I love and I'm living with a person I love. So I, I've got, you know, the, the best that is possible during this time, I think. Um, I do at times find myself a little overwhelmed by the thought that I'm not seeing all the best ways forward as we confront the crisis. You know, I, I know that we're handling each issue that comes up and I feel good about handling them, even if we, we certainly don't control everything. Um, but I feel like what I really would love more clarity on for myself, and so this creates a little anxiety, is um, thinking about having a plan uh, for sure about how we emerge in a strong position as a university uh, that, you know, to reflect the old uh, adage, there's always some uh, opportunity in a crisis. I worry about not seeing all the opportunities um, that are there that would, of course, add to the health and safety of our students and faculty and staff, but also just thinking of us, you know, in 2030, as we've been doing pretty nonstop for the last three years. You know, how is, how is that? Is that, are some of the things we talked about in Beach 2030 are they still the best way forward or should I, you know, can I come up with other things and who should I be talking to about that? So that that's kind of a, that on the personal note, the um, that kind of nagging anxiety that I feel. Well, I mean, if you, if you want my opinion, I would say that um, what makes you a great leader is that you do have these nagging anxieties and that you <laughs> not um a hundred percent set and confident uh, I, th I think there's nothing more that then we can do than react to some of these uh, emergencies but uh, of course we would like to be strategic but i think uh, you are and have been and will continue to be so uh, from my okay. point of view you shouldn't be anxious okay uh, i heard it here and everybody else said heard it here today good yeah, well, but um, so so how has it been? I mean, being a president in these times is just incredibly difficult, but kind of exponentially. So how has it been leading our campus this past year for you? Yeah, well, of course, it's challenging because it's, it is truly unprecedented in at least my experience. I thought I'd seen everything that could happen uh, to a university in 40 years as a professor and administrator. Um, but... Uh, <laughs> but I hadn't. Um, so uh, it's been good to uh, enlarge our leadership team a bit, having a medical, uh, our medical director uh, on it. That's really increased my confidence moving forward. Routinely, in, including our police chief, um, I think has been strong as well because the pandemic has created new security issues for us. So it's good to be uh, kept up to date about that. And, you know, in a strange way, um, uh, I think, I know I experienced, you know, in March, end of March, April, May, <clears throat> that all my attention was on COVID. I couldn't think of anything else, but how this was gonna affect our students and our staff and our faculty. Um, and while the pandemic still gets a lion's share of my attention, it's clear that all the usual challenges are also happening, you know, and that there's something, I, I both feel comforted by that, like, well, normal life is going on, and, and, and a little bit annoyed, like, can't people get their acts together during a global pandemic, you know, really? Uh, but um, it's, um, you know, it, it's, it's a sign to me that we are still moving forward as a university. You know, we're, thinking, we're constructing new student housing. Uh, we're, we're worried about safety, but we've been worried about safety for a long time. Um, maybe now it's because of the virus, for sure, but we're still working on our, you know, shelter in place locks and we're still increasing the sustainability of our power grid. So we're doing all the things that um, I think uh, seem more normal 
uh, to me. Um, uh, you know, I, I worry that I have um, is the lack of physical presence on campus, which is absolutely a necessity. I worry about how that might be affecting the mental health of our students, staff, and faculty. And I've been reading a lot about that. Mm. And um, I think it adds a layer, the isolation, the lack of um, connectedness, social connectedness, uh, adds um, an additional layer of um, challenge to for all of us, but especially, you know, as I said earlier, I get to stay with the, you know the person I love. So I have a person I have a person here to talk with, but not everybody is so fortunate. So that's that, that's something that I think um, uh, deserves our attention. And I know I, I see ASI moving forward with a lot of virtual engagement events. The Division of Student Affairs is doing um, the same. Um, uh, and I just hope that people can keep the um, energy up and the courage up to keep engaging, even if they're a little tired of staring at a computer or a little tired of reading email, um, that they see it as really um, something that will really add to their emotional well-being, just that sense of connectedness. I hope so, too. And I mean, in a way, as you were talking, I kind of, I don't always like this metaphor, but in in a way you're 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 like a war president that you know everything normal is going on and then you're also fighting this war and uh, so it's kind of, and of course everyone is so it's it's difficult it's it's difficult challenging but absolutely necessary mm -hmm. so I mean I've I've seen you obviously personally and I think probably many people have making the difficult decisions that presidents make. But um, for those who haven't seen you quite as closely, how, how would you describe your approach to, to making or taking difficult decisions? Well, I think um, I rely a lot on um, our team, a lot. I like to, um, you know, we do kind of a round table discussion about stuff and it, it really I try to keep my my, my options open until I've heard uh, uh, most of the people. And, and sometimes I, I certainly change my mind uh, in the process of, of listening. I know one <clears throat> issue we were talking about, um, uh, I guess now a month ago, time has lost its- Yes, isn't uh, it strange? To me, but maybe in August um, about opening childcare centers. And I entered that meeting absolutely convinced that we had to do that, that, you know, being for parents to be able to access quality child care means so much to them. And it means so much for their personal uh, happiness and also their academic success, so whether it's our students or our faculty and staff. But, you know, as I listened to everybody, I realized um, that that would be a bad choice, um, given just the economics of it and the dangers associated with it. For us at this moment, you know, things things might change. Uh, so it's not a, I'm not predicting, you know, nothing for another year or anything like that. But I think that listening to the team is probably the biggest influence on on the decision making. And of course, as you know, uh, and others who've been subjected to me, I, I like to read a lot of news. I'm always sending articles to people, so I actually read quite a bit early in the morning and. You know, I'm always reading about what are the other universities doing, universities we, you know, that we feel that we're comparable to or we, we feel generally are well, um, uh, you know, well, well run. Um, and then, of course, in the system, um, I have the advantage of fairly regular meetings um, with uh, the other 22 presidents. And uh, that helps, too, because I know that, you know, despite our differences, they're all in somewhat comparable uh, situations. So I, I think, um, you know, the, the, um, the, the being able to, you know, pull in all that information and, you know, get, get it in my head is, is important. But I will say that there, in most decisions, there comes a moment where I have, you know, competing options and then something happens in my brain <laughs> and I just think, okay, that's it. You know, that's that's the way it's going to be uh, after I've been able to um, absorb, uh, you know, absorb some uh, information from, from others. So 
Uh, and to me, that's a bit of a mysterious process because I'm not uh, I'm not writing the pros and the cons down like I used to. You know, I used to have the list of we do this, we do that. But um, sometimes, um, well, I'm, especially when it's it's difficult. Remember when we um, when we first realized that we would have to uh, offer virtual instruction? Yes, uh, that was uh, you know eventually we we got some you know the backing of the um the chancellor's office but really we were talking about that in our team immediately um and uh that was that felt like a huge um step for our university which has such a value on a high touch environment you know we're certainly mm -hmm. high tech but also the high touch environment and i really worried about um uh you know what it would do to the success of our students and so that it was, you know, eventually, you know, the chancellor made a decision, but of course he had talked to the president at, at great length uh, about it. But I, I felt like when we were alone and our leadership team talking about it, I, I could just feel that kind of weighing of options. And, but then once we thought, well, health, <laughs> health and well-being, then everything falls, you know, away yes. from, from that. So. And I mean, I think what's so powerful in what you've just said, Jane, is is I, I was sort of making a list of the things and sort of trying to name them as you went down them. And the, here, here's here's some of the things I got: uh, values, uh, benchmarking, consultation, uh, research, open-mindedness, uh, <clears throat> information processing, and then that very last thing you said: that sort of flash of intuition. That kind of gets it together. I mean, I think all those things illustrate, you know, your 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 compassion, your your heart, your mind, and and why you're a brilliant leader. So, <laughs> thanks for saying that. Um, I, I haven't always felt uh, particularly uh, brilliant. You know, some in the in the past uh, several months, many of the decisions we've had to make were was the least obnoxious of the alternatives you know mm -hmm. yeah, well this is bad this is worse oh, but that's the worst you know so yeah. that's not quite as satisfying as making a decision where we're going to build a, a great new building that the students and the faculty will just think add so much to their experience you know it doesn't doesn't have that sense of um, accomplishment it's, it feels more avoidant often and i don't like avoidant decision making generally i like approach decision making i, I get it and i mean God knows I understand it, but it's those, it's precisely those difficult decisions that, that you're talking about that, that I asked you. So um, is there anything, I mean, you, you mentioned something that you learned about, you know, stopping just writing down pros and cons and relying to some extent on intuition or, or wisdom, but is there something you've learned in this process about yourself or about leadership in general that you can share? Um, yes, that's a good that's a good reflection uh, for me to make. But you know, um, uh, as we move through this process, there was a period of time where I think I was not communicating very much to the uh, campus. Or when I was doing it, it was more of a cheerleader type thing. Like, oh, look, here's how we're cleaning the buildings. Look, here's what our police are doing. Oh, look, here's what our and. Um, uh, and then I, I sensed and was told, I, was, I didn't just sense, I, I was told by some people that they were really dying for facts. And I think I was used to sharing facts when we had vetted the facts, when we were really sure, you know, when we pass around um, drafts of what we're going to send out. And, we, and that's because we don't want to send anything that might be mislead people or, you know, share the wrong information. But I, I think what I learned is that people really get hungry for um, information and even uh, even when it's incomplete. So if I if I had something to do over again, I might um, I might say earlier, you know, here's what we're balancing and we don't really know. But as soon as we know, I'll tell you something, <laughs> you know, share some of that uncertainty, which, um, you know, I'm not used to doing because I'm I'm. I'm more oriented to trying to communicate uh, clearly about a direction. So I think I learned that maybe both about myself um, uh, being more willing to share the uncertainties, but um, 
also about leadership, that people want to be looped in. They don't want to be uh, left to wonder. Uh, yeah. So, when are you, so, you going to tell us something? Yeah. Right. So that's amazing. So really, you're, you're talking about trust-based leadership and, um, uh, you know, decisions in the face of uncertainty, which is really how life is lived. But um, <laughs> it's... Uh, that that's uh, I that's that's a great insight. So, sort of moving away a little bit from from your personal um, experience, or sort of what what um, are your top priorities for campus at this point? Well, the easy ones to that jump right to my mind, of course, are the health and safety of our of our entire faculty, staff, um, uh, student community, and and also that we. That are not a danger to the larger community. I'm really worried mm. about that aspect of COVID-19. Um, and the evidence is mixed. I've been reading quite a lot about this, about whether or not the university could become kind of a vector for a disease. It has happened in some circumstances, but not in all. So my top concern really is um, keeping people as well as they can be kept. Um, and, and but at, and at the same time, I don't mean but, and at the same time, allowing people to continue um, with their, you know, as a student, their academic progress, with faculty, with their research, their teaching, uh, trying to get that balance of, um, you know, uh, how much risk can one um, take uh, without harming one or the other, because we can't be, completely risk less. We can't just say, okay, everything stops. Right? That, that, that doesn't work. Um, so, um, but, you know, both those things, academic progress and health and safety, really top priorities. And then I think what I mentioned earlier that somehow we get, we use this time um, to really reflect on, you know, five years from now. And certainly some of the decisions that I've made uh, recently had to do with uh, were were kind of balanced, or they they I shouldn't say balanced. They they were predicated on what would I think five years from now? Uh, you know, we're doing some improvements, um, much needed improvements to some student residences where we really need to get updated fire suppression um, uh, things and, and fix some leaks and this and that. And um, I just thought, even in this financial in, insecure. Uh, environment you know we have we have the money to do it we've been put saving it and putting it aside uh, I should go ahead but there was of course there was another voice in my ear saying you should be saving all the money <laughs> that you can because you have no idea how it would be um, in two or three years except to predict that it would be much better it might be and it might be much worse uh, but when I reached the point of saying but what will I think five years from now I realized that I would be so um, regretful if our students were still living in, in environments that were not, you know, kind of top, um, really good for their health and their safety in, in right. the long run. So. And I mean, what strikes me so much about what you're saying is, is how it gives people an insight into the range of, of things that presidents focus on, which is from the huge, you know, what's the strategy, where's the campus going to be in 10 years, down to uh, almost the minute, uh, you know, what locks are we going to be putting on, on this particular door yes. and everything in between. But, but talking about, about the sort of some of the key strategic things, of course, this year has been an unprecedented year, not only in terms of, of disease, but also in terms of political um, uh, action. And I know that you've been very involved, for example, in, in conversations surrounding the Black Lives Matter movement and equity conversations in general. What, and I know you've just finished a, an, an intensive listening tour. And for those of you listening who don't know, the president has distributed to all the cabinet uh, the results of that listening and tasked us, the VPs, with taking actions. Uh, to try to change, ameliorate, or, or end certain practices. So what, what kind of actions have you noticed coming out of, or 
or outcomes have you noticed so far? Mm -hmm. Well, a, a big one, and you're, you've been um, closely aligned with this, is that we are getting the um, results uh, and findings from our big, our campus um, climate uh, uh, surveys right. from students, faculty, and staff. And these, these results will be put in front of a number of groups to be the basis of um, further action strategies. So I'm really glad that that's up and running, that's happening. Dr. Angela Lux is leading the effort, but with a, a larger team uh, from our ac academic senate, um, as well as my commission on equity and change and commission on uh, status of women and so on and so forth, staff council. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's very important to me. Um, we've also um, uh, completed some training, um, moving beyond bias training, um, and I, I and there's more to come. Um, you have engaged the CCEJ, the Council for uh, California Council for Equity and Justice, to be facilitators. Um, HR has found some training that would be uh, they have viewed as very valuable for uh, their um, managers. Um, we're collaborating with our very um, much valued faith-based. Um, uh, colleagues uh, and the city of uh, Long Beach to um, have them, allow them to use some of our computers um, because certainly if one clear thing that the pandemic evidence was the digital divide, which was somewhat um, uh, invisible to me about our students before because we have so much on campus for them in terms of labs and and um, good Wi-Fi and so on and so forth. So we've we've done that. We've delivered some computers that would go into community centers in North Long Beach. Obviously, that's a, a longer term uh, strategy. Um, uh, I know you've been working uh, with the faculty on the new ethnic studies uh, courses and requirements. I think that um, I I see that as a potential. Uh, well, I see it as a strategy in our um, efforts to dismantle systemic racism. College of Business, I think, has moved ahead with a great um, program uh, to uh, offer free consultation to Black-owned businesses, um, uh, which is, you know, always always valuable, but especially valuable uh, now. I'm, my our good friends in um, Beach Building Services are working hard. They're putting together a, 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 a t an advisory board uh, about where we can place our cultural centers. Now, that's that may not happen for five years, given various funding uh, priorities, but it could happen earlier if we kind of re if we repurpose some somewhat underutilized space. That will be controversial, so I might get calls and letters for just having said that out loud. But it's really my top priority that we find. Um, uh, good space for our cultural centers, our, our students. Um, you know, and um, URD have, uh, they, that team has managed to uh, start the process for uh, uh, a new scholarship called the Catalyst for Change that would be offered to scholarships and also paid internships or stipends for internships for students who pursue social justice um, uh, experiences. Um, uh, and I'm also very impressed with our police. We, they have uh, uh, they have forsworn the um, use of that carotid uh, hold that killed Mr. Floyd. Um, they are forming a community advisory board and engagement board to advise them and communicate. They're working on dashboards for um, disaggregated report of, of data around their use of force and who they stop. Um, they have already completed some police training, which comes from uh, the Obama era. It's called procedural justice, I think, principal, mm -hmm. principal policing or something like that. And I you know, was on another call um, with some of our faculty in the School of Criminology, and, it turned, and they mentioned the training as one of the few that actually have evidence of changing behavior. Um, mm -hmm. And um, they have actually, um, our police chief, along with uh, the other 22 campuses, um, are now working on a um, um, a project where they'll have the same um, standards of behavior across all campuses. And that's really important because 
while we don't call Long Beach City police to help us as a rule, we do call um, other campus police to help us in a kind of mutual aid if we feel like there's a situation uh, going. So I, I'm doing a lot of talking here, but I, I, that's some of these things are just they, they've already happened or they're in process now. And but there's a, a whole other set of things that are kind of just being just being built. Like for example, I have I've made a commitment to di further diversify all the various boards that I chair. Uh, now that takes a little time because we people have um, terms on a board. But while I have done some of that in terms of ethnicity, race, and age, I think I could accelerate that. And that would that would because the more perspectives we have around the table, the better off we are. I mean, because things happen. You know, we got some criticism for uh, a video that was made, kind of aimed, it was actually a video aimed at somewhat older alums and uh, kind of the nostalgia of coming to um, the campus in the 50s and 60s. And, um, but it certainly didn't project the image of who we are now in terms of a diverse, vibrant campus with lots of differences. And, you know, if we'd had maybe other people around the table, we would have noticed that we, we would have noticed that ourselves <laughs> and not, not had to wait to be uh, criticized about it, you know, appropriately criticized about it. So, so it's a, there's a, I feel like there's a lot happening uh, and part of our um, responsibility as a leadership team is to keep reminding each other and kind of checking on our um, progress and, and this array of dashboards that I've asked to be created, I think will be a major way we communicate that to the rest of the community. I think so. And I think, you know, if you think about um, about the timing of this, Jane, you, you may be being too hard on yourself. We've sort of got uh, 400 years of, of, of oppression behind us. And mm -hmm. in, you know, in a few months, you, you've made some changes, but clearly it's going to take, it's, it's a process. And the fact that you've started it and made it a priority, certainly I know every VP considers it our number one priority uh, or among our top priorities, let's put it that way. Um, it, it's very clear that you've expressed uh, what you expect to see happening. And I think, you know, the, the, the critiques, the criticisms that we're getting from, from, from the sources who are speaking is actually a great sign. It's not a negative thing. We've empowered people to speak up. They feel that they can trust you and they do speak up. And as you said, when you make difficult decisions, you go to things with an open mind and make changes where necessary. So I, I, I think it's great. And then of course, we also, I suppose, have a new chancellor who's the first ever uh, Mexican American and mm -hmm. first generation. And uh, so that's something very exciting too in, in these terms. It is a nice sign of change. And you know, I should have said that uh, in a more summary fashion about your question about the racial injustice. Um, the, after the 14 hours of listening, it was clear that our lack of representativeness among African-Americans, Black and African-Americans, and our rather piecemeal communication process to learn things about how is this going across? Just as you say, I do think it's a good thing when people feel free and they don't feel any threat in sharing that. Those two things, so I mean, there's, that's two buckets of representation and uh, communication. And, you know, I, I know we'll come up with, and we have already come, come up with, you know, dozens of uh, individual strategies or tactics uh, to work on that. But, you know, I feel, help, I, I feel hopeful because I think we, I, I can see pretty, easily that it could be that because, you know, we've been, I think my first year at Cal State Long Beach, we got 84 or 86,000 applications. Wow. And now, and just six years later, now we're, what, we're 106 or something like 106, that. 106, 20,000 yeah. more, yeah. And it could be, um, you know, maybe we got a little lazy about being more purposeful in, in uh, targeting people because we were getting, uh, many more ap applications and more applications from African-American, Black and African-American students too, but how many showed up was the, you know, they applied, they were admitted, but did they really come? So 
I think this, to me, it's a, it's a wake-up call, but it seems, um, I know, as you say, we can't get rid of 400 years um, of oppression, but we can, I think, create um, a measurable change. And, and part of that um, will come, I think, from one of our signature programs, which is the Long Beach College Promise, mm -hmm. where we have committed as a team of the city, the port, it'll be um, Long Beach Unified and Long Beach City College and us to really get an external evaluation um, because that, sh that could, should be the pri a prime pipeline of um, uh, Black and African American students coming to us. But it, that hasn't worked in terms of enrollment numbers. So I'm sure there's ways we can um, adjust that uh, and uh, really make use of what's really a national model and signature program uh, for us. And there's a lot of enthusiasm in each of the partners uh, to do exactly okay. that. Yeah, I agree. And I do hope that um, after November, there may be a more uh, listening ear in Washington for those kinds of efforts. But while we're talking about pipelines, I also wanted to mention something which actually, for those of you who are watching, the president asked me this morning, what is the fraction of um, black uh, doctoral students that we have on our campus. And it turns out that that is 9%. Yeah, I was and, very pleased, yeah. And so uh, we're doing something right there. So congratulations to the colleges and the faculty who are teaching those doctoral programs. And if we can do it at that level, we can do it at every level. So yeah. the if we, future that would, be, that would be more than doubling our current um, uh, percentage of at the undergraduate, undergraduate level, yeah, uh, correct. students yeah and so we can do that it's um so sort of putting in uh taking out your crystal ball here uh what, what do you see becoming a priority in for in the future of higher education what what do you see down the road mm -hmm. Well, I think um, uh, for everyone, especially all publics, public universities like ours, I think coming up with uh, additional strategies that ensure our fiscal re um, resiliency are just vital. We can't, this year by year funding from the state, but I mean, the state will always be our primary partner, obviously with California State University, but we, we simply can't guarantee the level of excellence to our students and our faculty and our staff if we if we're subjected to you know these great um, drops in state funding. I mean, twenty we we took as a campus twenty million dollar loss. That's that's a bit that's big. Um, so I think coming up with um, uh, strategies that really buffer us and and that would be true from for other universities as other public universities. And part of that, I think, may come, you know, we had talked through Beach 2030 of really increasing our commitment to our self-support side with a special focus on different populations or new audiences of students. Mm. Not running away from our traditional, you know, um, uh, commitment to, you know, 18, 19, 20, 24 year olds. I think our average age though is 26. Is that right? I, I may be. So we're, we, we're a little bit, we're moving on up there. But the, the students of the future will be older uh, and they will be even more diverse and they will be even uh, more economically challenged. I mean, that's what this wide agreement among um, demographers uh, about this. So <clears throat> I think uh, committing for at least some of our faculty to a more mixed approach in teaching methods. You know, we, we were kind of forced into that um, uh, through the pandemic, but I've heard that some faculty have really taken to it. They're creative, they're doing well. Well, maybe those, uh, those faculty or others among our lecturers and tenure track faculty um, could really help us build that self-support side and then be able to invest uh, resources from that into our general program um, so that when the state you know, hits a hits a wall. We have some reserves to, uh, you know, uh, carry us through. So I think that uh, that's a big priority for me. I mean, obviously, in the nearer term, it's you know, it's making sure we can open our university again, um, uh, so that those who uh, feel safe coming to campus, we can offer them the safest, you know, environment that we that we can can do that. But I think for all, for us and everyone else, the pandemic has 
illustrated some structural weaknesses in our uh, approach. Uh, and even though you know we have very high efficiency, we have some of the lowest tuition in the whole country and offer some of the best educational experiences in the whole country, that uh, we, can, we, can't, um, we can't keep raising tuition or we won't be uh, accepting our mission uh, as a state university, but everything else is getting more expensive and the state support has been really declining. It has never bounced back from the Great Depression, uh, the, the last Great Depression, recession. Yeah. So um, I think, um, you know, some real, um, really looking at that and uh, taking it seriously and, and we have to stop just wishing that the state would give us more money. You know, just one, you know, a couple of years, yes, but then, then no. And I don't see it sustainable um, uh, over the long term. So I, I'm, uh, I'm usually the optimistic one. So you must tell the other vice presidents that you heard me being a little pessimistic about, about, about that. Uh, but I think we can, I, you know, I feel like we have, a, we have the capacity to um, be more autonomous, be more resilient. Um, and I think it's necessary to do that. Well, um, you you know that I agree with you, and I mean I I think that given the <clears throat> the the depth of knowledge, expertise, and excellence on our campus, and I'm talking here of the faculty, staff, and students, mm -hmm. um, we, we have so much to offer, and I think we can do that. Um, as you say, I think the important thing which you said, and I wanted to emphasize for our audience was that this is not an either or choice, it's a both and. Mm -hmm. So we keep our excellence, we add to it, and we offer additional access and opportunities to perhaps non-traditional age groups, lifelong learning, all those things. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I actually think that's exciting. And you um, know, we've made some moves on that already, um, obviously, but I think we, need to go at warp speed um, now uh, toward it because some of these jobs that have been lost uh, during the pandemic, they're not coming back. And, it looks like it. Yeah. And uh, so there's going to be millions of Californians who will need to upskill and reskill or finish a degree or, you know, and, but, you know, all of that means uh, not just, oh, we're going to add a few courses. We have to really look at the structure of our processes you know, what does it mean for course approvals? What does it mean for accreditation? You know, what is it, you know, the whole, the whole nine yards. And I think that's something that's been uh, occurring to me and feels like, oh, that's a big job. It's not just adding people, it's really examining, not just how we deliver a course, but what does it mean for other um, kind of rather sacrosanct processes mm -hmm. that, you know, yeah. come to accept. No, absolutely. And I think in addition, you've, you've touched on the curriculum, which of course is a faculty matter. And, um, but I think the discussion on, say, ethnic studies and how or whether we should perfuse some kind of ethnic studies uh, expertise into our whole curriculum uh, it, it becomes an important one. And so uh, it, it seems that this is wrapped up together in re-examining the university in a, in a way it's quite daunting in another way it's quite exciting yeah yeah but, i mean because think about issues of uh, uh promotion and tenure uh, sure. and sure. of course the senate is currently opening up that policy very bravely and yes. uh, i think we have a real opportunity to be as we often are in the vanguard in this and uh, maybe we can come up with a sort of newer, innovative, more creative, and supportive RTP policy. I mm -hmm. certainly hope so. Yeah, I certainly hope so too. Yeah. So, well, sort of maybe uh, let's move from the, the serious and strategic and, uh, and future into sort of uh, just the uh, personal, but, but have you picked up any new hobbies or are you doing anything new during the quarantine or? Well, um, uh, I, I have um, a, a long planned, um, uh, enacted a long planned uh, goal I had was to go through all my stuff, you know, clothes oh, and this wow. and that, and say, uh, uh, so really, could somebody else use this better than, than I'm using it, you know? 
So now I've moved, I, I kind of have shopping bags and a whole closet in another room filled with things that when I figure out how to do it, I'm gonna give away either to our own campus professional uh, clothing um, service mm -hmm. or somewhere else. So that's, that's been kind of fun and uh, uh, to do that because I've thought for a long time that eventually I will move out of this house and I don't want to take everything here with me to wherever else I'm, the next place I go. Right. That would be just so silly, uh, you know, to yeah. do that. And there's still some um, uh, targets in terms of books. I haven't started looking at that yet because I actually have a lot of my books at my office. Um, I have been doing more cooking. You know, we, we used to mm. be out or entertaining several right. times a week. And yeah. so I, I, I don't know that I've gotten any better. And I wish I would be like others I've heard about who talk about now they know how to make bread. You know, I, that's too scary for me to imagine, but I have been doing uh, more of that. And um, we did plant a garden, which we probably would not have done. Uh, oh, that's lovely. And so, In the front uh, or the back, Jay? Uh, the back. Uh, the back. Oh. And uh, so, you know, just a uh, colleague got this great uh, new thing. Imagine like a tower and it's, you, you can create compost in the middle and put dirt around the outside uh, goes wow. down and there's little places to uh, plant. So we've had um, uh, basil and cilantro and lettuce. And things. so that's been kind of fun just to watch that happening. Although it's amazing how quickly some creature starts to eat at my green peppers. You know, <laughs> how do they find them better than I find them? I, I don't get that part yet. But I've started collecting recipes because now I have I have so much basil, I feel like I need to learn how to do a lot with basil. So much, in fact, though, that Kali recently said he was a little tired of that taste, that pesto taste was a little... <laughs> so, yeah, a lot, lot, yeah. Of, lot of green stuff. It's, uh, well, that's, it's interesting. I wonder, you know, you, you, mentioned, uh, you mentioned the things that people are doing, like baking and gardening and uh, sort of sorting out. And it just strikes me, of course, I've been doing much the same kind of thing. And I, uh, it just strikes me that we're getting down to basics and uh, kind of just, you know, what's important in our lives. And as you said, it's relationships, the people you love, the, the place you live, making it beautiful for yourself and others. It's, uh, mm -hmm. Well, I have heard a lot of people that that there's a lot of renovations going on, a lot of... Um, I believe so, yeah. Well, we, we, we did some of that, or at least to, to our level. We painted our deck, and uh, it sounded quite easy until I was painting all the iron railings and thinking, oh, yeah. wow, <laughs> these have got four sides, and I can't get any of them. <laughs> so, uh, that makes you know you chose uh, your profession uh, wisely. Wisely, yeah. No, 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 nobody, would, nobody would employ me as a painter, I can assure you. Um, so just to end off, I mean, you, you mentioned hopefulness, and, and I think that's such a crucial thing in any leader. But, but w what's made you feel the most hopeful this past year? Uh, well, I, I think for, su for sure seeing how... Um, People reacted. I mean, I, I'm no, I'm not naive, and uh, I'm sure this. Some people did not react, whether it was faculty or staff. They resented the the change and the demands for change by demanded by the situation. But overall, I found the creativity and the flexibility of people to be, you know, actually quite inspiring. Um, and uh, you know, I think we'll know more as we uh, see each other a bit more, but, you know, I'm still tuning into academic senate meetings, going to staff council, but, and, you know, that um, sense of purpose um, is, I, I sense it as being strong, um, uh, and so that's, that does make me hopeful, and, and then as a kind of unexpected silver lining of the pandemic, you know, our grandchildren spent most of the summer with us, our youngest son, oh, and his lovely. wife, mm -hmm. uh, came down from San Francisco because all the day camps that the children were gonna go, they're eight and 10 years old. And there's nothing more, um, I think, facilitating of hopefulness than to be around eight and 10 year olds who uh, are uh, you know, incessantly joyful about everything. Oh, look at that bug, or look at that flower. I can make this out of mud, you know, it was unbelievable. So I, I would be watching them or interacting with them and that would certainly add to my sense of, um, it, that things were going to be okay. Uh, in fact, my granddaughter, who's eight, <clears throat> was wanting me to promise that I would stay 
here in Long Beach until she could go to college because she wanted to go to college at Long Beach and live at live at our house at our university house. So, well, but there you are. Happened, but there so, you are. There you are. Yeah. You heard it here first, folks. <laughs> the president has guaranteed to another fifteen years. <laughs> <laughs> No, oh, that's a wonderful, that's a wonderful story. I love that uh, the word that you chose is such a short one, but such an impactful one, joy. And the, the joy of young people, the joy of our students, the joy of our community, I suppose, coming together and, and making things work, uh, not 100%, but pretty close, is, is really quite remarkable. Yeah, so. yeah. well, I, I'll add just one other thing. You know, we were dealing with a particular issue, and I realized that for everything we, uh, if we decide as a team, as a university, this is important, we always find a way to do it. So the mm -hmm. real issue is not, can we do it? It's, is this important enough? You know, and of course, and, and those are harder decisions uh, to do it. But that, you know, when I finally, that dawned on me, um, I thought, well, this, you know, we may make a mistake in emphasizing, the, you know, this, but it's not because we can't do it. It's because we um, either have chosen badly to emphasize it or, or not. So that, that made me feel better because I was thinking about all the major changes and building services and mm -hmm. delivery of courses and all these health protocols that we have and now the testing, the testing solutions that we that we need. You know, I just feel like it's gonna happen. Uh, you know, because we because we know it's important. I love that optimism and I share it and uh, I agree that progress almost uh, inevitably results in some some mistakes, but in a way that the mistakes are are there to help us make the right decisions. So mm -hmm. yeah. making growth, growth mindset. Make, right. Yeah. Growth mindset. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Making no decisions is also a decision. <laughs> so, <laughs> so anyway, well on that note, uh, I will thank you again to President Jane Close Connolly for being our honored guest today. And for those of you watching um, we hope that the rest of your year is uh, hopeful, optimistic, and filled with joy. So, yeah, thank take you, care, Brian. and go beach. Go beach, indeed. Bye bye. <laughs>